Ladies and gentlemen, Shao Kyo. Thank you. Good evening. I fucking hate panpipes, so I hope they go away. Uh, I don't have a magic clicker, so I'm going to squat down occasionally and push my buttons. Uh, I am Charcourt, also known as Eric Drass, and I make art, uh, often uh, at the edges of culture, which is germane to this evening. Uh, so let's talk about culture. This is the first of many uh, old white men with giant beards you'll see in my talk this evening. Uh, this is E.B. Tyler, who is a Victorian anthropologist who defines culture this way. It's that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, yada yada yada. Um, acquired by man as a member of society. Now take note of this word man, because it's not like that anymore. In the Victorian age, culture was entirely made by men and women. Now there are other people involved, there are other entities involved. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But personally, I like to think of culture itself as an organism. Um, culture is a animal that lives in all of us. It's instantiated in each of us in some small way, and culture can only exist with humans around to support it. If overnight we got hit by a magic mind eraser from space, uh, we'd be fucked. Right? We wouldn't be able to speak, we'd be banging rocks together. Culture needs humans to exist. But that's not really the case anymore. Um, culture lives not only in humans, uh, but also in machines. Culture lives here. Uh, this is a data center in the middle of the desert that supports Facebook. Culture is happening here. It's not just happening in this room as people speaking. It's happening as people make status updates about their cats. Uh, in a real sense, this is a repository of culture, just as much as the British Library is, as horrible as that feels. So a lot of the work that I do uh, is related to what I call algo culture, uh, which is this interface between things that humans do and the things that machines do, and what that kind of means for us as a species. Um, here's my first gratuitous Alan Moore uh, slide. Hi, Alan. There you are. Um, <laughs> I'm slightly thrown by this. I've shown this slide probably a dozen times at various talks, but never with Alan Moore in the room. So, uh, excuse me if I swear a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, Alan has an idea which he calls uh, idea space which is that outside of the external reality that we take for granted, there is another space, a space purely of ideas that lives in the mind. And when you have a new idea, or you investigate a new piece of art, or create a new story, or paint a picture, you're actually going out into this space of ideas and finding stuff. It's pre-existing, in a way. Um, it can be thought of as a, a landmass. This could be uh, Western Christianity. It could be a major landmass and then people go off and uh, create Mormonism. Um, but these ideas could come from anywhere, and we go out and we search for them. And what I do with machines is to get machines to go and explore idea space for me. Um, now, what do I mean by that? Uh, there's a long history of the artist's apprentice in art. What would happen to you be a 10, 12-year-old boy, usually a boy, in the village, and someone would come along and say, you? are going to be an artist's apprentice. And you would then spend 30 years of your life grinding up pigments, sweeping the floor, uh, doing all the shitty jobs. Um, I believe these days they call it internship, but it's, it's much the same thing. And the artist's apprentice would stand next to the master and learn his techniques, and eventually he'd be allowed to maybe paint a tree or something. Um, but generally, most artist's apprentices never surpass their master. But there is a, a legendary story about uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Apparently, he painted an angel as an apprentice of Verruccio, and the angel was so wonderful that Verruccio snapped his paintbrushes in half and never painted again. That's pretty rare. So when I talk about using um, algorithms to explore this idea space, it's very much like this Mickey Mouse story. Um, they're not very sophisticated. They're not the same as humans. They don't know as much as humans but they work really fucking hard. Uh, so you can send them off to explore every aspect of idea space and come back and tell you what they find. So I'll introduce my first work of this evening. Um, you may have noticed that the internet is full of lies. Um, just as much untruth is propagated as truth. 
Uh, often you will see things in your social media feed that say, oh, that totally lines up with my view of the world. I'll just retweet that. And very rarely are these things actually um, supported by facts or citation. The excitement of seeing an element of culture that agrees with your own view is so great, you just go, great, I'll share that. Um, this one is an example of uh, Barack Obama's foreign student card from the internet with an exhortation to go out and share it with everyone. Because look, it's not really an app. It's a lie, but it's a very compelling lie for people who live in a particular photobot. Uh, so I built a machine that lies. Um, this is Factbot, and every four hours it makes up a lie. <laughs> and it posts them on the internet. In, uh, in a compelling meme-like form, has a nice picture, and drop quote. Um, caterpillars are attracted to the colour blue, more the colour. Possibly, I don't know. Um, a coat molecule is made from uh, uh, 182,000 uh, individual hats. Less likely, but not impossible. It's an idea, right? Uh, I found that the, uh, the lies that involved celebrities were particularly popular, so um, I added more of those. This is a Drew Barrymore is capable of surviving on average for six weeks without eating. <laughs> plausible. Um, the ones that I like the most are the ones on the edge of plausibility. So this one, crows and uh, crows emit ultrasonic sounds to communicate with each other. Apparently that's actually true. I built a machine to lie and it came out with the truth. Uh, this is also a personal favourite. Um, it takes a cricket up to 49 days to digest the donor of uh, This is the number one hit on Google Images for cricket. So my machine, exploring idea spaces, oh, there's cricket. Uh, I'm not the first person to notice this imbalance between uh, what we see and the truth of the world. Uh, Marx Radius, second century Roman emperor, he was on it, right? Um, it's been around for a long time. We're not really, uh, we're not really surprised with the idea of lies existing in our culture. But what's different is we're now playing this cultural game on a different infrastructure. We're playing it with machines. We're playing it using machines between each other, mediated by machines. Um, and that means machines can get involved as well. Uh, gratuitous Robert Anton Wilson slide. I thought we needed one this evening. Um, <laughs> Hail Eris. What? Thank you. Uh, Bob had this great idea about idea uh, reality tunnels. So a reality tunnel for Robert Anton Wilson is the sum of the reality that you project for yourself. So the set of ideas that you have about the world, your beliefs, your prejudices, your knowledge, they form a structure that controls how you actually perceive the world. And people with different reality tunnels see the world differently. There is no explicit external reality to be found. Uh, and it strikes me this is very much like building a box to explore idea space. I get to control the reality tunnel. I can say, this bot only knows about this stuff. Go and explore and tell me what the world looks like if that's the only thing you know. So the second work I'd like to talk about is uh, machine-imagined art. Um, recently, the Tate uh, released data about 70,000 of their artworks. Every, one art, every single artwork they have in their collection has data around it, when it was bought, what size it is, what it's made out of. Uh, but it also contains a bunch of information that has been generated by humans. Uh, this is from a category called uh, emotions and human qualities, things like love, fear, despair, but also pessimism, hedonism, uh, serenity. It's got an odd collection of words. What strikes me is that this was made by humans sitting in front of a painting and saying, this painting's about pessimism, and then entering it into the data. And this is now, for a machine's reality tunnel, this is the truth of the space of the Tate's art. Um, and of course, it's a brilliant reality space. Right? This, is, this is an idea space which encompasses all the ideas of all the art that the Tate has. So I built a machine to uh, generate new artwork. Uh, this is a description here of an artwork that's been generated from the data that Tate provided. 
Apparently it's made of a banknote, a hand-cut book and monotype. It displays the qualities of contrast, weight and sequence. It talks about nostalgia, gratitude, innocence, yada yada. Note the symbolic quotation, dog of loyalty and label of alchemy. <laughs> I want to see that. That's already a fantastic piece of art. Um, uh, here's another one. This is made from painted wood, flies, and scanachrome print. I don't even need to go any further. I want to see something made out of wood and flies in print. Uh, note the symbolic Jordanian border of Israel. Doll of childhood and serpent of war. Remember, this is made of flies. <laughs> the fascinating thing about exploring idea space this way is, this way is because um, there's a lot of stuff to find, um, an awful lot of stuff. And in fact, I did a quick calculation of how many artworks could be made using the system. Uh, that's 88 million artworks. The potential idea space of just the Tate data includes 88 million possible works of art. And it prompted my favorite ever um, comment on the internet, which is that if every living human being got busy dashing off one an hour, we could be done only two by 10 to the 18 years. Unfortunately, if the works averaged a kilogram in weight, they would not only produce the crushing force of gravity, but would actually produce fusion before the project went. This is a difficult project. Um, I recently uh, put Machine Imagined Art onto Twitter, and it posts a new hypothetical artwork uh, every few hours. And by current calculations, the universe will reach heat death before it's done. So that's quite a lot. So part of what's going on here is this uh, idea of perceived intentionality. We look at pieces of culture being made by machines, and we assume that they're making it like us. If I see that joke about caterpillars loving blue, it feels like a very human kind of joke to make. But the machine doesn't really know that. But we project intentionality onto it. Um, my daughter recently was studying plants at school, and she turned to me at Lloyd's school and said, Dad, does a plant have to be happy to flower? Which is a perfectly logical question if you're a human. Like, I knew what she meant. She knew that she was expressing an idea that I could understand. Plants obviously don't have inherent happiness, but we're happy to ascribe emotional states to it. We say, well, this is a happy plant, it's flowering. We're very keen to assume that everything we interact with is like us. So we give the benefit of the doubt and perceive intentionality. Uh, here's another work which plays with the idea of intentionality. Um, Theresa May, Queen Witch. Um, this is a Twitter bot that never sends a tweet. Uh, what it does is it looks for a set of hashtags that you might be using and then uh, she answers you to a set of lists. Um, <laughs> aberrant voting behaviour, <laughs> candidate for extradition, <laughs> irritant. <laughs> and this really freaks people out. Um, <laughs> some people get very upset. They're used to a social media system where people communicate with each other. But I haven't really thought about being put on a list by Theresa May. <laughs> um, intentionality is kind of important, uh, particularly in the world of law. The intent behind an act has legal ramifications. Uh, the difference between murder and manslaughter is one of intent. Uh, so what happens when there are seemingly intentional acts being done by machines? This is a, a favourite artwork of mine recently by a Swedish group of artists called the Darknet Shopper. Um, this is an algorithm that is connected to the Darknet, which is unlike the normal internet and is full of some dodgy things. Um, and they would feed it with $100 worth of Bitcoins every week and say, go and buy something. And when you bought something, can you post it to the gallery, please? <laughs> and so they ran an eight-week show with empty patrons on the wall, and as the artwork arrived through the post, they would put it up. Um, it got some knockoff designer jeans. Um, it got uh, the skeleton keys from the fire brigade to open all locks in the building. And then eventually, soon enough, it got 10 ecstasy bills. Delivered to the gallery, placed in the vitrine. Um, 
the Swedish police are uh, far more forgiving than the British police. And they came out and said, oh, this, 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 is, this is interesting and bizarre. But, um, we, we will take the pills. I can't imagine that happening in this town. So these machines, they're out there, they're creating culture, but they're also looking at us. They're uh, observing us, and these algorithms are classifying us and making decisions about us. Um, face recognition is now more efficient by machines than it is by humans. Um, they can, five minutes, uh, they can judge our emotions. Um, it's a bit difficult to see here, but there's an algorithm that can spot the stress level from a video purely on the shape of the face and the eyebrows. These judgments are being made by algorithms and being made about us by machines. Um, but we don't really know how they work. Often these systems are using uh, neural networks, which involves throwing lots and lots of information at a simulated brain until it learns something. And then you go, oh, it's learned it now, great. But how it's learned it is completely opaque. Inside a neural network is just a set of crazy numbers. Uh, recently, Google tried to turn it on its head with a project called Deep Dreaming, where they looked inside the neural network and said, hey, what, what do you see when you look at this stuff? What you, what, what's going on? Um, and it produced these incredible images. Um, uh, so this neural network has been trained on dogs uh, and tractors, similarly. And so when presented with that image and saying, look, can you find, can you find, can you find, can you find, this is what it found. Uh, anyone who's ever taken psychotropic drugs will find this sort of work very familiar. Um, here's another one. Here's a mountain scape with, a, with an enormous ferret monster. I don't know what it is. Uh, um, but fascinating. Oh, I can look inside the mind of a machine and it'll show me what it thinks. Uh, here's one of Alan that I made. Um, uh, I'm particularly pleased with that one. That was a lot of iterations to go that far down it. Uh, but we can all look at it and go, oh, it's our more. It looks a bit funny, it's our more. Uh, but if you look inside the machine, the machine responds in uh, different ways. These are all valid images for this machine. So this blob over here, the machine will say that's a king penguin. Even though to us, it's clearly not a king penguin. Because the machine doesn't see the world like us, because it's not made of the same stuff as us. All the machine knows is how many images have been thrown at them. Uh, this can cause some problems. So Google recently applied their sorting algorithm to people's online photographs and classified black people as gorillas. Um, this is a result of the statistics that is given. The internet is full of nice, shiny, white-faced Silicon Valley bros and not so many black faces. So lo and behold, it miscategorized them. Google's response was simply to take the category of gorilla out of their system didn't attempt to retrain it. They just said, OK, well, we'll just... Um, I asked Wolfram Alpha what the picture of Alan Moore was, and it said it's a piranha. So, um, <laughs> so interesting. Uh, penultimate piece of art I'd like to talk about is a tripping bot. I'll do it very quickly, because I know we're out of time. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the online resource Erowid, which has uh, been going since 1995. It's a collection of psychotropic experiences uh, both drug-related and non. Uh, but there's lots and lots of stuff in it. And I happened to find 100 megabytes of drug reports. And thought, hmm, what can I do with that? Uh, the problem we have with artificial intelligence is it's a kind of pinnacle of great minds. The idea of an artificial intelligence is it's going to be an Einstein or something. Whereas, in fact, if we look at ourselves and our own consciousness, we generally want to get a bit fucked up. We kind of like messing with our conscious mind. It's one of the things that makes us interestingly human. But artificial intelligence doesn't do that. It concentrates on being very, very clever in a boring way. So I thought I'd look at that by building a machine that takes drugs. Um, this is Tripping Bot. She starts taking drugs at 6 o'clock in the evening and writes drug reports based on her knowledge of uh, other people's drug reports. As the night wears on, she gets more and more chaotic. Um, so she, you know, by, by uh, 11 o'clock, she's, she's pretty way out there. Um, the drugs that she takes are all uh, science fiction drugs, harvested from Wikipedia, so she'll tell you what she's, what she's doing. Uh, recently, I just trained her to start drawing, because a lot of people like doodling when they're wasted. Um, this is one of her drawings. 
um, and she now uh, creates a drawing in real time based on her level of intoxication. Um, which makes me think about the will of this machine. Right? What, is, what does this machine want to do? And I look at that and it looks fast, feels kind of human-like. It looks like it's doing something with intent. Yeah, we've talked about intentionality. Uh, Uncle Al here has a lot of thoughts on will, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, but let's quickly skip through Bob, who describes magic this way. Um, magic is a dramatized system of psychology, which is kind of interesting. It's like a, a dramatical display of a piece of idea space. And it has commonalities with art. Um, art like magic is a science of manipulating symbols. Who manipulates symbols better than anyone? Computers. They do it really well. In fact, that's all they do is manipulate symbols. So, knowing that I had to come and give this talk, I was scratching my head for something that would demonstrate uh, the will of the machine to you, uh, in a kind of Crowleyan sense. So, uh, I had a little think about what a machine might do if you were to teach it all of the Necronomicon. <laughs> Uh, which is kind of spooky. While I was working on this, uh, only yesterday in fact, as I was sorting out the data, a little alert appeared on my computer saying, Crowley has just followed you. <laughs> a Twitter user calling himself Crowley followed me while I was doing this work, so let's tread carefully into a chat with perilous. <laughs> May the dead rise. Seven sacred learned ones. Zi din ye kia kampa. Gaya shu shagamuku tu. I won't go on with the rest for fear of uh, ramifications. Uh, this seems like pretty legitimate stuff in the Necronomicon, except this was written by a machine yesterday. Um, I built a model of uh, the Necr Necronomicon's incantations and said, run me some more. Uh, this is a little dangerous uh, for those who are magically inclined. And while I was looking into it, I did find this guy who worried me. Uh, this is Humwawa of the South Winds whose face is a mass of entrails of animals and men. His breath is the stench of dung. Humwawa is the dark angel of all that is excreted and all that sours. Uh, so he's one of the guys that may get summoned by Algo incantations. So be a little bit careful. Uh, but it struck me the incantations on their own um, were interesting, but they weren't really full of any potential magical power. So I decided to build a sigil generator for them. Those of you who are familiar with chaos magic will be familiar with the use of sigils. So it's minus three over here, give me one minute. So you take your sigil and ask the machine to generate them. And you get a magical sigil for this algo generated incantation. Uh, if you would like to reach under your benches, you will find that I've generated 180 algorithmic sigils, uh, unique for every single one of you. Uh, this is an expression of the idea space, so idea space is the machine. This is its true will. So you can do what you want with these. Uh, you can exchange them with your friends. Uh, you can uh, use usual chaos magic techniques, stare at them at the point of orgasm, for example. Uh, burn them, bury them. But implicitly, this is a piece of idea space that's been spewed out over all of you by a machine. And hopefully expresses the true will of that machine. So I'll leave you with Uncle Fester and remind you that do what thou will should be the whole of the world. Thank you very much.